Hello, and welcome to this introductory webinar on the Speeding Research Tiffin Interventions Programs, or as we fondly call it, the SPRINT Program. My name is Cynthia Vinson, and I'm going to share some of the logistical details about SPRINT, and we'll then turn the webinar over to Edmund Pendleton, who is one of the two faculty members that will be leading SPRINT. The SPRINT program was developed based on feedback from many interviews that we did with investigators when we were trying to determine how best NCI could help investigators with moving their research more rapidly into practice. We developed this SPRINT training and piloted this training last summer, and this training has been modified slightly based on this training. So the training that you will be applying for has a bit of a modification, and some of the information has differed from what was previously posted on this website. Many of you received an email from me at the end of January that described the SPRINT project and provided information on the eligibility for this program. The SPRINT program is open to NCI-funded investigators with a currently active R01 grant or an R01 that was completed after December 31st, 2013. We did a portfolio analysis here at NCI, and we hope that we captured the names of all the investigators that are potentially eligible to apply. To clarify up front, the focus of the R01 grant must be on the design, testing, and delivery and or implementation of, the behavior, of a behavior change intervention or tool. And the focus needs to be on advancing cancer prevention and control. We are offering a small amount of money to supplement travel costs for teams to participate in this project. And the goal is that the teams will successfully compete for funding for this program. We have contracted with VentureWell, who will be managing the delivery of these supplemental funds. There are some key dates that were mentioned in the email that I sent. The application timeframe is short, and the application process is pretty simple. The applications are due on February 24th. We are going to be conducting 15-minute interviews with each team that applies between February 27th and March 3rd. The SPRINT in-person training will be held in Rockville, Maryland, April, April 17th to April 19th. Following the in-person training, there will be a weekly online meeting for all of the teams every Monday starting on April 24th and ending on June 5th. There will not be a weekly meeting on May 29th due to the Memorial Day holiday. Edmund is going to be providing details about the course content in a moment, but it's important to know that teams are expected to participate in the in-person training for the full three days, as well as the closeout meeting on June 15th. All members of the team are expected to be there. The rest of the time, teams will be back at their home institutions conducting interviews with stakeholders. So as you can see from this slide, these are the key dates to keep in mind as you're thinking about the SPRINT program. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Edmund Pendleton. Going. I have a number of slides that I want to cover today. I'm going to go relatively quickly. Uh, you will have, obviously, access to the recorded version of the webinar, and I'll make sure that you have access to the slides. I kind of want to hit you with a lot of stuff to think about, but I also want to reserve plenty of time at the end for Q&A. So first, a quick introduction to the teaching team. So it will be myself and also Elizabeth Mathari, who's on the line today, and we both are very experienced in this methodology that we're going to talk about, and also have venture-backed experience, uh, been in startups, and worked in the sort of venture creation space, so we're very excited to actually share that with you. So let me start with a high-level question, kind of why i -Corps. You're going to hear this phrase or this program name, and I want to give you the background so you know where it's coming from. Uh, in fact, it was an NSF program. It was created about four years ago. Uh, you may know NSF has about $7 billion of research as compared to the $30 billion that NIH has. Uh, but they had this question, uh, similar to a question that NIH has had itself, which is, you know, how could we increase the economic 
impact some of the research dollars that we're investing every year. So it's really starting with this question, if you will, that led us down the path towards creating the i program. And one of the things that I really want to point out here, and this is really important, and I think something that distinguishes this program from many others that are out there, it was developed by entrepreneurs. You'll hear a little bit about Steve Blank if you end up taking the course and, and seeing some of the material that we use but uh, developed by entrepreneurs and, more importantly, taught by entrepreneurs. And I think this is very critical. So all of us have worked inside and outside of universities. We've taught classes and whatnot. But first and foremost, we actually are coming at it from a practitioner's point of view. I've been out there and done that, had lots of fail failures and some successes along the way, and that's one of the reasons this program really resonates with me. So I don't know how familiar people are with the startup world, and I want to kind of come back and say this will all be tied in together with what you're trying to do with your interventions in a little bit. But if you look at sort of the startup world, and if you read any of the popular press, you'll hear this phrase called lean startup, and a lot of the foundational material that we use came from that. Some interesting articles if you have time to take a look at them, one in Harvard Business Review, another one in The Economist that really talk about what lean startup is. And sort of at the highest level, it sort of borrows that phrase from lean manufacturing. You know, what can we do to get a startup out of the ground as quickly as possible uh, and invest only a minimal amount of money in the beginning so that we don't spend a lot of time chasing something that isn't worthwhile? I'll spare you the further details for another time there. Now, I like to show this slide because it resonates more with me. I'm actually a physics undergrad in a big space and astronomy buff. And I love this quote from Buzz Aldrin, so I always use this. You promised me Mars colonies, and instead I got Facebook. So we were looking for something like this, and instead we got this, right? And the reason I use this is it's kind of a setup for me uh, to point out to folks that i really is the first program to apply some of those lean startup principles uh, to complex engineering, technology, and science-based, I will say, projects and startups, even though it just says startups here. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the rest of the day. So a couple of quick points. Currently, there are seven locations across the country where the curriculum is delivered for NSF and NIH. Um, but I want to point out that it's really not the institutions that you see here. It's a natural, excuse me, a national resource. And these courses are available to anyone. So you don't have to be affiliated with any of these schools. And we actually have another 30 schools that are kind of junior partners in the program as well. So there are lots of opportunities to reach out to the i network once you go through one of our programs, and that, that's another big asset. Uh, Elizabeth and I are based out of the D.C. area. I'm at the University of Maryland. Elizabeth is now independent, but she used to work at Johns Hopkins, so we're actually in the mid-Atlantic area. So you might be thinking, and this is certainly something that NIH was thinking just a few years ago, well, that sounds really interesting. You know, lean startup and all that stuff is usually applied to software companies, and I'm maybe kind of going along with you that it might be used for some engineering and tech-based businesses, but can it really work, you know, for life sciences? And the short answer, as you might have guessed, um, is, is yes. And, in fact, we were able to show this with a program for NIH uh, just a couple of years ago, which I'll quickly go into here. So. You know this kind of history. NIH, of course, is a much bigger agency than, than NSF, but they had the same fundamental question, right? How can we increase the economic impact of the research dollars we invest every year? And just like the NSF grantees, you know, we found that there's really, we believe, a better way to build life sciences startups or, if you will, to actually transition um, interventions from the lab to market take technology from lab to market, and we think this is a much better way to do so. So we created a program and ran a pilot uh, for the NIH uh, i -Corps for SBIR program through NCI, and we did this back in the fall of, of 2014. I won't go into a lot of detail. I will tell you if you're interested in kind of seeing some of the results, if you go to Steve Blank's uh, website, it's just steveblank.com. He blogged about it. There are links to a number of the companies that went through in case you have an interest. Now, the types of companies we dealt with were in devices. We had some therapeutics, and we also had some diagnostics uh, teams, and we even had a few digital health teams. Uh, we did not have any intervention teams, but I have dealt with some of those in another context, which I'll describe here in just a bit. So the key thing to kind of keep in mind, 
and this may or may not apply directly to you, is really it's not so much about the execution of the science or, or the research. It's really trying to find a way to help these folks reduce the technology, regulatory, and, and market or customer risk. And in your case, you might want to think of it as the implementation risk, right? Somebody somewhere has got to take a, take a chance that implementing whatever you've developed will actually bring value to their stakeholders. So somebody somewhere is always paying, as I like to say. And we really need to focus on customer needs. Now I'm going to pause here because I've gotten a little note. Cindy, is the how is the sound? Is it acceptable or or, or not? Sound is good. You could just speak up a little bit. It would be great, but we're not having any breaking. Thank you. Great. So I'll try to be a little louder. So why is i especially valuable for life sciences? There's sort of several reasons for this. Okay, number one, there's a lot to learn in these markets. Uh, it's probably no surprise to you. Uh, they're very complex and often involve many stakeholders. And one of the key things about i is just understanding that simple fact. It's not just knowing who your customer is, potentially, but all the other stakeholders involved in a purchase decision or implementation decision. And the pathways to market are often very lengthy, costly, and complex, right? Pretty simple, but it turns out these are things that are pretty obvious when you start dealing with teams like this. And of course, startup risks are generally very high. Again, coming at it from sort of the, the life sciences side. We're gonna run two more of these SBIR cohorts in 2016, one that will start in March and one that will start in June. And I only bring these up to point out that NCI has already adopted the i methodology in another context for its SBIR companies and we're quite convinced that we can adapt it as well for the implementations or interventions, excuse me, that you all have been working on too. So behavioral interventions, will it work there? Our hypothesis is yes. And as I mentioned earlier and Cindy alluded to, um, some of what we do in i is offered through HHS in another program called HHS Ignite and that's where this idea actually came from. So I'm actually relying on Cindy and the other folks uh, there that went through the course to validate that, yes, this is worth trying out. So we're excited that you're with us, and we hope that we can bring you into the initial cohort. So let's step back. I keep using the phrase i which really means nothing. It's a brand name. Let's talk about what it really is for a moment. I like to point out that the name i comes from innovation core. So it's not just startup core, it's not entrepreneurship core, it's actually innovation core. So what we teach in this program is much more about innovation, to be quite honest, and the pathways of getting that out into the market. So I don't want you to think it's only a startup class or it's only for people who want to start businesses, because that's not true. It's equally, if not more valuable, for researchers that just want to understand how that process takes place, how they get things out of the lab, how they get things implemented in the real world. So I've used it for just ideas. I've had teams that had nothing more than an idea come in. For products, not a surprise there. Services, processes. Again, the folks at HHS are looking for ways to improve internal processes. And then again, I'm going to say it's equally valuable for interventions, which we're going to talk about again as we go through this webinar, and we'll be developing a customized curriculum for interventions over the next couple of months before the actual cohort kicks off. Okay, so one of the things I'd like to share with people before any i -Corps course is why are we really here? And let me point out something that's kind of different than, again, a lot of other programs. So our goal is really to improve your odds for success. There are plenty of people out there that try to do this. They try to pick winners, right? There are accelerator programs that you can come in and they'll invest a little money in you. Uh, you can talk to venture capitalists or investors and others, and they're usually trying to pick winners. But that's really not what we're doing here, and I want to point that out because that's another critical difference. We're here to improve everyone's odds for success, whatever that may mean for them. So we aren't looking for a 10x kind of return or multiple like a venture capitalist might be. We're hoping that whatever we do for you and you only will help you in your path forward. If you look at startup statistics, and I will 
rephrase it and say great idea statistics. Let's assume you're not even interested in a startup. This is the chart you see, right? Lots of failures, lots of strikeouts. And again, this is sort of a chart that represents startups. Early stage ideas are typically even more risky. So depending on where you are, you might be a little bit more or a little bit less risky. But the basic point here is most startups fail. It, it's, it's just a simple fact. And the reality is I'd love to tell you that I can completely flip this chart, but I can't. I can only hope to sort of nudge that slightly to the right, if you will. Uh, we'd like to create and enable more winners. In, in essence, our goal is to kind of shift this curve. But the reason I want to bring this out is that I can't promise anyone that you will inevitably succeed by doing what we tell you to or advise you to do. We're going to improve your odds for success, but we couldn't guarantee it, can't guarantee it, right? If we could, I wouldn't be doing this, right? I'd be out there just doing that over and over for companies and selling them, right? So anyway, just to point out again, we're here to help you improve your odds. There's no prescriptive formula for success, but we think this is the best way to help you. And again, for all those that have been out there and been in startups, that's why we gravitate to this program as instructors. So a couple things, and I apologize a little bit because some of this is going to have a bit more of a startup flavor to it, so I won't overly dwell on it. But let me go through a few things here that I think are relevant to you, and then we'll make sure we have plenty of time uh, for some questions here at the end to go through a little bit more detail. So one of the frameworks we use is something called a business model canvas. Now, you might look at this and think, you know what? I'm not interested in building a business. And I hear you because not everybody is. But the framework that we use here for this, using this canvas actually is very applicable to projects, uh, to other types of mission-based activities. A lot of things are very similar. Now, most of the time, or I should say most of our effort will be focused on understanding customer segments and value propositions and several other things that are related to this canvas that will be specifically relevant to you, even if you have no interest at all in ultimately trying to create a business out of it. But if you do, that's even better because we're going to cover things that would be necessary for you to cover if you were going to build that business. So I keep saying that the methodology doesn't require that you have an interest in doing that, but I also want to make sure that you understand that, of course, it will accommodate that because that's where it ultimately came from. So we use a process called customer development to build up these business models. And let me explain at the highest level what that is. So number one, there's this concept of a problem solution fit. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means can you identify and validate a problem or need in the market that enough people care about? Now, a lot of the life sciences teams and companies I deal with kind of already done this, right? There's, there's a need for you know, a therapeutic drug to cure a particular disease or to do something. Everybody recognizes that there's a need. But the question is, is that problem or need big enough for you, right, and what you're trying to get out of it in terms of whether you're trying to spin out a new business or license something to somebody or transition an intervention to some organization. So it's kind of a relative thing. Can you identify a problem or need that enough people care about and that enough people is kind of that relative part? Are you looking to create a venture-backed business or just try to get something into the market that helps people and you don't care ultimately about the return? But it's one thing to sort of find that problem or need. It's quite another to develop a solution for it. Now, we use another phrase here called the uh, product market fit. Maybe you might want to think of it as the intervention fit, but here's the concept. The concept is can you build and deliver a product or service or perhaps an intervention that satisfies that customer problem or need. They're two very different things. It's one thing to identify the need. It's quite a different thing, though, to actually be able to deliver a solution that meets that need. And a lot of us jump right into trying to build that solution, right? And I did that as a startup founder. I started with the solution, and then I went looking for the problem. I assumed that there was a problem because I'd had it, and then I went to see if enough other people had it after I'd built the product, right? So there's this sort of two-step process, and we'd like you to start with the problem first, go to the solution second, and then fundamentally, something that some of you may be interested in, which is, okay, do I just have a product idea, a service idea, a new intervention idea, or is there perhaps a business at the end of this sort of search, if you will? So basically the concept is, 
can you build a repeatable and scalable business model? So again, those three steps. Is there a problem or need that you can identify? And most of you have probably done that or assumed that. Is there a solution or an intervention that you can deliver? And I'm sure a fair number of you have done that too. And then is there really a business or is there some other way or mechanism for getting this thing out into the real world, which as we all know can be really a challenge. So if you're not interested in creating a startup, just think of this idea of the business model fit as being the, if you will, how you actually get the intervention adopted in the market. Okay. The fundamental theme of what we're going to be doing is this. If I had to summarize the entire course in one slide, I would use this. It's this concept of getting out of the building. So we're going to really push you to get out and interact with people that are involved in your ecosystem, right, that have an impact on whether or not your intervention gets adopted. So we like to say validated facts versus these untested guesses, right? And evidence comes from what we call these customer discovery interviews. And that's why we're going to use them as sort of the foundation of the course. And we call this sort of evidence-based entrepreneurship Again, if you want to substitute entrepreneurship with a word of your choice there, evidence-based implementation of interventions, that's perfectly fine. The basic concept is, though, we're going to push you to go out and help guide you in how you go out and do these interviews with the stakeholders that are involved in your ecosystem. Okay, almost done. A couple more points, and then we'll wrap up for Q&A. So at a high level, what is this concept of customer discovery? I talked about the interviews. I want you to think, though, when I say customer discovery, I want you to think stakeholder, too, because it isn't just what you would typically think of as a customer. Okay. What we start with is helping teams really identify that primary customer segment. And this sounds so obvious to most people. Like, oh, I know who I developed this thing for. But when you spend time with them, you realize, oh, maybe not so much. They're going after a very broad market, or they're going after multiple types of customers that have very different needs. So one of the things that we do is spend a lot of time with the team is trying to help you really focus in on who has that real critical pain point or need that you're solving. Where can you start in the market where the need or the problem is most critical? And trust me, for every startup I've ever dealt with, been a part of, helped coach to this process, that's one of the most difficult things to do. So we really try to push teams to do that in the beginning. Equally importantly, can you identify the key roles, let's say, in an implementation decision? Right? Who's involved? Right? In deciding whether something gets implemented, something gets purchased, who makes that decision? And is it multiple people? In all likelihood, it is. And it's up to you to sort of figure that out and map it out. One of the things that I point out, because this is where sort of the nomenclature gets a little bit confusing for people at first, but I want you to think of it this way. Every customer segment has stakeholders within it. So let's say for whatever reason I had a product, actually like my startup did, that you could sell into construction companies, and at the same time, you could sell it into people that built airplanes. Well, within the construction industry and then within the airplane industry, the stakeholders were very different. And it's, the simple thing is that this will apply no matter what type of business you're uh, trying to develop, you'll find that stakeholders vary based on the customer segment. It's an important thing to keep in mind. So what do I mean by that? Well, think of it this way. Here's some examples. There's typically an end user somewhere, a decision maker, a payer, often somebody we call an influencer or multiple people that are influencers that are outside the organization. Recommenders are people that are within the organization. And then there are always what we call saboteurs and skeptics, right? Folks that for whatever reason don't want your solution, whatever it is, to be adopted. You know, by the way, in some life sciences cases, you not only have an end user, you might have somebody called a beneficiary, a patient, right? Somebody that benefits from this, just like you would, that might have absolutely no choice in the matter of whether or not they receive that treatment, 
or the intervention, right? So there, this is not an exhaustive list of the types of folks you need to identify, but it's a pretty good starting point. So the basic point here is that there are all these different types of stakeholders. You have to understand them in order to actually get something implemented or done. So it's one way of repeating what I said a moment ago, which is different customer segments have different stakeholders, and different customer segments often have different purchasing or implementation decisions that they make as well. And that's why we group customers into segments, logical groupings where the problem or need is similar, and the same business model can reach them. So a quick note on value propositions quickly. One of the things that we spend a lot of time with teams also helping them understand is what's a real value proposition? What are the benefits that you're actually deriving you know, for your customer or target market? And most people think of features and things like that that really aren't the true benefits, and we'll spend a lot more time in the course going through this. But I just wanted to point out again that what you'll find is that different customer segments often have different value propositions. And even if the value propositions are similar, they might rank one thing more importantly than another thing. And this is what really distinguishes these different groups of people that you're going after. Okay? And that's also the case with the stakeholders. So even within a customer segment, let's say I'm sell selling again to the construction industry or selling to the aerospace industry, you would find that the end user decision maker and payer, for example, might have different value propositions even though they're within the same customer segment. Right? They have different motivations and it's up to you to understand what those are. Pretty much, you've got to understand all of them. And to put it sort of in the context of the business model, there's lots of work to be done well beyond the time we spend in this course. You know, if you continue to implement your intervention or try to build a business, there are lots of other things that you want to build out. And what you'll see is you kind of naturally progress through the canvas, filling out the boxes as you go. And it's not like you're just writing things in here. This customer discovery process helps you validate whether or not you're headed in the right direction. So bring it back high level, wrap it up, and we'll, we'll open up for questions. So a couple more things, and we're done. So what are you going to do? Uh, Cindy, you sort of alluded to this. You're going to jump in. As we like to say, I love to show this picture. Uh, you're going to jump in. You're going to have about six weeks, and we're going to ask you to do about 30 interviews. Obviously, the more you can do, the better. Uh, you're probably going to have this sensation in your gut. Oh, no, you know, why do I have to do this? You know, why do I have to do this? Well, I like to quote <clears throat> two famous startup gurus, I like to say. Number one, this probably will resonate with you, uh, Richard Feynman, a uh, famous physicist from the last century, and he had a great quote. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and yet you're the easiest person to fool. And that's one of the best ways I can summarize the whole i -Corps process. And then if that doesn't resonate, I always like to turn to Mike Tyson, another startup guru who once said everyone has a plan, you know, until he gets punched in the face. And if you think about it, that's kind of the point behind getting people out, out of the lab, interacting with folks that are actually out there in the real world and trying to really truly understand their problem or need. And I'll just wrap up by saying I've made all 10 of these startup mistakes myself. You'll notice number one here, which I think is particularly important in what we do in i which is basically building something nobody wants, and we want to help you avoid that. Uh, number three is also particularly relevant, which is lack of focus. So that really sort of wraps it up. I'll refer to a couple of things here that you can take a look at later if you're interested. There's some interesting results from the i program. I'll flip through and show you a couple of things quickly, and then we'll um, answer questions that you have. <clears throat> so we've done about 600 teams in the past four years, over 300 companies, closer to $50 million now raised, and i is really becoming the premier federally funded innovation and commercialization, commercialization program in the U.S. Uh, in fact, uh, the White House has been talking about it and had a demo day this summer and a big press release where they talked about the i program. Mr. President, you can go to YouTube and listen to his announcement about i -Corps. Uh, it talks about expanding it from the academic research into the small uh, businesses funded through the SBIR program, and more importantly for you, expanding into other agencies. As I mentioned, we're already doing that at NCI. I'm going to wrap up by saying that's the reason we're doing the Sprint program. I'm very excited uh, to hopefully have each and every one of you participate in the program this summer. So 
with that, I'll stop my monologue. I hope that was reasonably clear. But I'm now available. Cindy, we can turn it back over to you to start taking some questions that uh, folks may have. Thank you very much, Edmund. And I'm going to ask a question of Edmund, and I may have to jump in and answer some of this as well. One of the things that I've received questions from people has been about the composition of the teams. And I was wondering if you could talk about the team makeup that we're looking for, for people that are applying. I'd be happy to do that, Cindy, and correct me if I say anything that isn't quite in line with what you had in mind. I will tell you that in the NSF version of the program, we bring in three people in a team, and it's usually what we call an entrepreneurial lead, a principal investigator, and then a mentor. And often that mentor is from outside of the organization. But I'll be honest with you and tell you that I always tell people, as long as whoever's on the team considers him or herself to be a founder, I'm okay with it. So I like to see teams of three. I think that's a good number. I've dealt with teams of two before. But basically what we need are at least two people that are committed to the process, that are willing to jump in and do the interviews. So I know that you may have specific requirements, Cindy, on your side in terms of a PI participation and that type of thing, so I'll let you comment on that. But I will tell you that the methodology itself and what we teach is equally valued for any two- or three-person team as long as those folks are committed to doing the work. Thanks, Edmund. And just to let you know, um, I think for our projects, the PI does need to be involved. A question has come in around who can be an entrepreneurial lead, and a number of investigators have um, asked if a community partner could be an entrepreneurial lead, and I'd love to get your thoughts on that. You know, from my perspective, you know, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Cindy, that would be perfectly fine as long as that partner is invested in this as well, right, in exploring the intervention or the project. I'll, I'll kind of leave it to you to maybe give certain examples. And I think the reality is what I would encourage people on the phone to do is if you have a specific question, just either ask us directly or apply, and we will tell you, right? I mean, we want people in the program, and I have many times in the past, if a team has applied and been a good candidate for, for whatever reason, needed an additional team member or maybe needed to swap one, that's what we would recommend. So I don't want anybody on the phone to think, oh, no, I shouldn't or I can't apply. I would encourage you to get the application in, and then let's see if we can help you, you know, pull the team together if there appears to be any issue. But I don't see any reason why not, personally. Excellent. So another question that came in is really related to the mentor. And we've gone a little bit back and forth on this. We do not require teams to have mentors. Um, but we would encourage people to think about who might be a good mentor. Um, right. Can you make any suggestions for people on how to find a mentor? I think there's questions around, since they're not part of their organization, how do you actually find them? Right. So a couple of things. Uh, I will say that because we teach the course in multiple different formats for different customer segments, quote, unquote, ourselves, when we're Teaching this to academic researchers um, that are coming out of the lab at a university, we, we encourage them to find somebody that's either had some startup or industry experience that can help out as a mentor. Um, it's tough. It's a volunteer position, um, you know, so you have to find someone that has the time. But we think it's very valuable. Um, when we're working with SPIR companies, sometimes they don't have mentors. They just bring a third person along from their team. But here's what I would say, because we're doing a relatively small cohort in terms of the number of teams. Uh, Elizabeth and I are going to act in somewhat of a mentoring capacity ourselves. Where we won't be able to help you, though, is in helping you find interviews, right? So the best type of person, depending on where you're coming from, um, would be somebody that maybe has contacts in the area or someone who can help you reach out to folks that you may need to talk to. Now, it's better if the mentor is geographically close to you so you can meet in person. But if you happen to know someone in another state or across the country that is really connected into the field that you're trying to enter or the market you're trying to enter, that's certainly something to consider too. 
So, and I've worked it before where a mentor might be able to come in and just do, you know, I, I won't say that I encourage it, but if a mentor can only put in X amount of time a week, sometimes we'll bring in and have co-mentors. Sometimes we have a part-time mentor. So the bottom line here is if you can find somebody willing to help you that you think would be a good mentor and that person can commit X amount of time, bring it to us directly and say, this is what the person can commit to. Do you think this would work? And we can talk about it. Because I don't think there's a precise answer I can really give there. Excellent. Thank you. Let me see. Um, so a question came in saying that someone is still developing their behavioral intervention and it hasn't been tested yet. Um, so the outcomes data isn't there. Is this relevant to the early investigator, to the investigator that's early on in their research? Um, and I want to say, and I, I'm going to give my point of view, and Edmund, I'd love yours. We think that it's valuable to be thinking about how you design for dissemination um, up front as part of your research, so I think it could be valuable. Um, and there's just, and we're going to be evaluating this to see where's the best place for this to fit with investigators coming in. Edmund, would you like to weigh in on that? Absolutely, Cindy, and thanks for bringing it up, because one of the things that, that I'll emphasize, and again, you heard me say, probably too many times here, startup, startup, startup. But I tell people that I think one of the best times to capture them, you may recall that I said I've used this process for people that had nothing more than an idea, is actually to capture them at that stage, you know, before they spent too much time trying to design a solution, whether that's an intervention or a new product or new service. Because what we're really fundamentally trying to teach you to do, or how what we're trying to teach you to do, is to reach out and sort of do that problem and need assessment in a much more interactive way than you've probably ever done it. And look, I know, I was a startup founder, and I, I locked myself in a lab for 12 months and built what I thought was the perfect product because I was a civil engineer, third generation. I'd been a surveyor as my first job, and we were building a product for surveyors, and I thought I knew what I was doing. So we all do it, right? But again, trying to push people out, Cindy, in the beginning, I think is so critical. So no matter where you are in this process, I think you can get a lot out of it. it. Might be slightly different based on where you are, but you'll get a lot out of the process. And I like to say the earlier the better. So I would Excellent. encourage them. Um, another question that came in, um, and I think that we probably may have asked, answered this a little bit earlier, but someone wanted to know if it's appropriate for a doctoral student that's working on an R01 to be the entrepreneurial lead. Um, Edmund, what do you think about that? Well, and certainly there's no reason a doctoral student shouldn't be an entrepreneurial lead other than time commitment. So, I mean, that's sort of a personal thing. I will say that we've had some great um, entrepreneurial leads that have come from all different types of backgrounds, including doctoral candidates and postdocs and others. But you've got to be able to commit the time. Now, we, we, we typically are asking people, we want them to think of this as, as a 20-hour type of a week type of commitment, so like half time. So if you're taking a, a full load of classes or you're getting ready for your thesis defense or something like that, you know you absolutely don't have that time, I'd say you might want to wait. Now, again, it doesn't mean you have to do 20 hours every week. There are obviously going to be some weeks you work a little more, some you work a little less. But I want people to think that there's a pretty significant commitment here, and you shouldn't take it on lightly because you won't get as much out of the program if you do. That actually answered one of my other questions about the time commitment. Um, and we are asking people to spend about 20% um, of their time on this so that they yeah, can I, get as much out of this. Yeah, again, um, the, the rule real quickly, uh, Cindy, is simple one, right? The more you put in, the better. But, you know, realizing people have other, quote, day jobs, we, we understand that. The one thing I will point out is a little different is, you know, if, a, if you find a mentor who is really good, you think is a perfect fit, and that person just can't commit to the full amount of time, let us know. There might be a way to, to make that work. Uh, but, but the two main people on the team have to be thinking this is going to take some time you know, each week. Yeah, and the PI does not need to have 20 hours per week. It's a 20% um, of effort that we're asking yeah. for, not 50% of effort. So Yeah, sorry, I misspoke. Uh, I, I use the different phrases based on who I'm talking yeah. to, so you have to catch me when I misspeak, but yes, that's, that's fine. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of clarify that. Um, another question came in, and it has to do with an R01 that has distinct but related components, um, one delivered in person and one delivered via mHealth. Um, 
both of the components need further development and they want to know if they could propose to develop both in the sprint program or do you need to choose one what how would you respond to that edmund well i actually think and i don't know the details but i'm going to make an analogy that i think probably is a fairly decent one we get plenty of teams and companies that come in that have a hybrid between a virtual solution and a physical solution right they'll have a physical product that has software or some sort of virtual interface. And so elements of the product or solution are very different, right? But they, if they kind of are naturally complementary and they go together, they kind of require together, and I say bring them through together. If they kind of stand alone and, you know, you can easily separate them, you, you kind of might make the case that you should focus on one as opposed to two. So it kind of comes back to how integrated they are and, and necessary for one another. And if they're part of the same solution, you bring them both in. If they can be carved up into two, separate them. So I would tell people in our course, if you have two product ideas, just bring the one in. <laughs> right, that's the best way to think of it. Um, another question is, is can the PI be the, the entrepreneurial lead? Edmund, what's your experience with that? <clears throat> Certainly, if as long as there's someone, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's, from my personal perspective, I don't care whether you call yourself an entrepreneurial lead or a principal investigator. I've had some principal investigators come into the, the course and act as the entrepreneurial lead. And the reality is, if you're starting a company, you're all entrepreneurial leads. I don't care what your titles are. So, yes, um, you know, again, from my perspective, Cindy, and I'll have to let you give the, the, the exact answer, I'm perfectly comfortable with a PI serving as an EL, but, we'll, but ideally we'll have another team member too that's committed to, to doing the work. And, and I think that that's exactly correct. I would want to see if the PI is the entrepreneurial lead that there's at least a team of two, not just an individual coming forward as part of the course. And I think that the primary reason for folks to, to understand is these interviews, you know, you, you've got to get your, you know, comfortable and go out there and do it and you, you, have, you need somebody to help with collecting and taking notes and doing the interviews and getting your courage up. I was looking for that word a moment ago and couldn't find it, right? And I think that there's some camaraderie here that's very helpful, and I think that any startup is a hard thing to do. By the way, there's a great chart I did not show, which is the failure rate of, of what we call we call them solopreneurs, right, single entrepreneurs. is actually much higher <laughs> for, for reasons you might be able to guess. So the same goes here. Thanks. And I have to say, participating in the HHS Accelerator Program, having a team surrounding you really does help with the interviews and being able to kind of digest the information that you're getting from the people that you're, that you're meeting with. So um, another question that we had relates to an R01 that is an R observational study, um, that the subsequent R01 is going to be an intervention study. Are you eligible for this program? I would say that at this point, you know, we did a good quick cut of the portfolio analysis, but we really want people that have interventions already started just as a cut point. Although, you know, if you, we, since it has to be related to your parent R01, I think that that's um, the reason why we wanted to make sure that you had an intervention that was already being developed. So we can talk about that and, you know, reach out to me separately and we can, we can make a decision on that. There's a question about can we add an analyst to help with data analysis and interpretation? Um, Edmund. I think that would be great. So let me explain. Um, when we send people out, and you will learn this in the course, to do the interviews, basically what you're collecting is information, right? It's, we like to say it's like the scientific method. You start with a hypothesis, you design an experiment, you run a test, look at the results and you iterate or pivot based on what you've learned. So there's this concept you have to look at the data. Um, and so if you have someone that can help you, by all means, that would be fantastic because I think that that's one of the things that most teams struggle with, uh, to be quite honest. So sure, if you can enlist somebody to help you out, absolutely. And I think that it's just also realizing that it's in the context of the very small amount of money that we're offering. So. Um, we're not fully paying for everybody's time as part of this. We're really hoping that the, the hook is helping you think about um, understanding your customers' 
in the broader sense of the term and helping you to design your interventions with dissemination and implementation in mind so that at the end of your research study, your plan for how you're going to move your intervention out into practice um, if your study is successful is better formulated. So do we have any more questions, Sarah? Edmund, any final thoughts, recommendations? You know, I think, yeah, I think the final thought is, is just sort of a caveat I probably should have started with. I know there's a lot of jargon in what I talked about, and some of it probably doesn't make a ton of sense. But what I would encourage you to do is I'm a big believer in this process. I think it works particularly well for things other than just tech-based concepts. And I think this is going to be a great program. And to some degree, you, the early participants, are going to help us shape what it becomes. Because I don't claim to think that we'll have it perfectly done the first time. So I'm looking for people that are willing to come in and help with that process, too. So it, it's a little bit of a collaboration. There's a lot of what we're going to teach you that I know is absolutely appropriate, but there's some of the things that you might also bring in that we can use in, in developing and improving the course as we move forward. So anyway, that's the way I'd leave it, and I hope to see folks this summer. Thank you very much for your interest in SPRINT. I hope that you will visit the SPRINT website and submit your applications. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or to Tara Loomis at VentureWell.